Hello, everybody, and welcome to the start of Unit 6 on energy resources and consumption. Uh, this unit is all about energy, where we get it from, what we use it for, and how our usage impacts the environment, and ultimately, how we can produce, transport, and consume energy in a more uh, economical, sustainable way, but also environmentally sustainable way. So uh, to start off, I'm just going to introduce some basic topics uh, and trends in energy usage today. So first of all, there are two types of energy uh, that we're going to be talking about in this class. There's uh, renewable and non-renewable. Uh, you've probably heard these terms before. You may not know what they mean, but renewable means that it can be replenished naturally at, at the rate of consumption, right? So things that can um, replace themselves as we use them. Whereas non-renewable resources exist in a fixed amount, there's only a limited supply of them, they cannot be replaced at all or on a scale that is comparable to human lifespan, um, so they will run out, right? So renewable ones are ones that recharge, non-renewable uh, do not recharge. Some examples of renewable resources include wind and solar, uh, because the wind doesn't run out and neither does the sun, uh, at least not on a human time scale because uh, you know, the sun will die out eventually, but you know, they're talking billions and billions of years from now, so don't worry about that. Non-renewable resources include things like coal, oil, uh, plutonium, or uranium that's used for nuclear energy. Those are things that are uh, in limited supply, right? Uh, as we'll learn about later, coal and oil are fossil fuels that do form uh, so they do regenerate, but it's on, a, it's on a scale so slow that it can't be replaced as fast as we're using it. Uh, energy is often obtained through fuel. Um, that fuel could be coal or oil, or it could be uh, the fusion reactions that are happening on the sun driving wind and solar patterns, right? Um, in terms of the fuel that uh, uh, you probably think of most, though, uh, fossil fuels are the most consumed fuel source worldwide, whether it's coal, oil, or gas. Um, and these these uh, types of fuel are not equally distributed around the world, right? This is a map showing where most of the coal is found. There's different types of coal, as I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and you can see that there's a decent amount of coal in the United States and Canada. There's a lot in Russia, uh, China, and parts of Australia as well. Meanwhile, if you look at places like Brazil, Northern Africa, Northern Europe, no coal at all, right? So that's going to change the way that um, communities and populations adapt to energy usage. Um, and it's going to depend on the geologic history of the region, you know, what kind of volcanic activity is happening there, plate tectonics, etc. So in terms of uh, fuel sources, the first one is wood. Uh, wood is a really uh, easy to use uh, because it's, it's super accessible. All you have to do is chop down a tree and you can burn it. You don't have to process the wood really at all. You might have to split it or something like that. Um, you can also form charcoal, which uh, burns even better than that. Right? So it's often used in developing countries um, or uh, you know, poorer communities because there's, it's, all you got to do is chop down a tree. Um, and you burn it to access that energy. You'll find that is the case for a lot of these fuels. Uh, peat is probably a lesser known, but similar to wood in that it's relatively easy to access. It's a partially decomposed organic material that has been, it, it's in the process of being converted into fossil fuels, but it's in the very earliest stages of that, right? Um, and these peatlands are often found near swamps or marshes, um, and they are a huge carbon sink because they have a lot of grass that is absorbing carbon and nutrients into the soil. So the soil is very, very rich and it's densely packed with organic matter that is partially decomposed um, so it can burn really well. Um, peat is uh, one of the places it's commonly found is in the Netherlands, which is in Europe. Um, and the um, hundreds of years ago, the Netherlands people harvested so much of their peat that they actually lowered the elevation of their country to the point where they s experience a lot of flooding in the country now because they basically dug so much of this peat out of the ground. Um, and so now they've had to install major levees to prevent flooding because a lot of their country is below sea level because of all that harvesting. Uh, here's a picture of people harvesting peat in Ireland. You can see they just kind of dig through right underground um, and uh, chop it up into little blogs. Uh, next is coal. Uh, we're not talking about coal sprouts here, we're talking about C-O-A-L. Uh, and there are three types of coal that you need to be responsible for, and they form under different conditions uh, related to heat, pressure, and how deep they're buried under the ground. Right? So as organic matter is compressed under layers of sediment underground, uh, and it's heated, it will go turn from you know, organic matter, it will turn into peat. 
that's not coal per se, um, but as it gets hotter and more pressure, it will uh, get converted into lignite, which is sort of like a flaky, uh, impure coal. Um, continuing to add heat and pressure converts it to bitumous, uh, bituminous coal, and then finally to anthracite, which is the most purest form of coal and uh, sort of uh, the cleanest burning, so to speak. It's often used in indoor um, heating systems because it um, produces the, uh, the least amount of um, air pollution. Um, next is natural gas. Um, this is probably what is used to heat your home, most likely, or if you have a gas stove, this is the, the gas that is being combusted during your stove, uh, uh, within your stove. It's mostly methane, which is CH4, um, and compared to coal and petroleum, it burns the cleanest, so to speak. It's still a fossil fuel, so it produces lots of CO2, but um, per unit energy produced, it, it releases the, the least amount of CO2 compared to other fossil fuels. Um, and uh, petroleum or oil is uh, another major fuel source that we use mostly for transportation purposes. It's extracted from uh, various places, you know, you can extract it from deep underground in oil deposits, but it can also be extracted from these places called tar sands, um, which is a mixture of clay, sand, water, and this material called bitumen. Um, and you can refine that mixture to uh, extract the oil and then process it. It's an expensive and lengthy process, but it, it is possible. Um, so how are these fuel sources, whether it's coal, peat, oil, etc., used to generate electricity? Because that's the end, often cases, that's the end goal, right? Sometimes we use coal to heat our homes, per se, directly, uh, but sometimes you use, um, you know, it, it to, like a coal-burning power plant will you be using coal to generate electricity. And it does it through these six steps here, right? First, you're going to burn the fuel. Um, there is chemical energy trapped in that fuel, and you can release it by combusting it. We've talked about combustion before. So they crush the coal, then they combust it. And what that's going to do is going to release a lot of heat that then heats water. So water is flowing through a pipe in this uh, boiler chamber here. And as it's heated by the combusting coal, water evaporates and it turns to steam. And what we know about steam is that steam is a gas. Um, and so it will flow through these pipes here, and as the steam condenses and turns back into water, it will sink, which will turn a turbine. And that turbine is attached to a generator, and as that generator spins, it will generate electricity, which is then uh, gone through a transformer and distributed to um, uh, uh, houses and in industries and stuff like that. The water in this plant is cycled through. Um, and that will come into play when we talk about nuclear energy. Uh, it has a similar setup, so just keep that in mind. Uh, here's another diagram showing the same thing. We've got the fuel source, it's burning. Uh, here it's coal, oil, gas, whatever. It's heating up water, which will turn into a gas and uh, rise. It will pass through a turbine, which turns and uh, uh, helps activate a generator to generate electricity. Uh, Non-fuel based electricity, things like wind turbines, geothermal energy, or dams, use the same thing, uh, same idea of a turbine turning a generator, except instead of burning a fuel, right, uh, you just have a, a giant wind turbine attached to this, right, that's what a wind turbine is, or for a dam you have water flowing through, which turns this turbine, um, geothermal, you have steam coming from the earth, which turns this turbine, so this idea of a turbine activating a generator is pretty, pretty consistent throughout all power sources, or uh, uh, power plants. Cogeneration is a phenomenon that we have been exploring all year and didn't realize it. Cogeneration is when you're, when you're producing power through, say, electricity generation, you're also producing heat, right? So when you use a fuel to generate electricity, you're also going to produce heat. And we know that's the case because of the second law of thermodynamics. No energy transfer is 100% efficient. If I eat a salad, I'm only getting 10% of that energy. The other 90% is lost as heat. So when we're using fuels to power our car or create electricity, we're going to generate a lot of heat, and that energy is lost as heat. So why not use that heat for something, right? One of the most common examples is that when you use heat in your car in the wintertime, you're not actually, you're, the car is not, you're not turning on some system in the car that's going to start generating heat. You're just, the, 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 uh, the air system in your car, air is flowing through around the engine and capitalizing on the heat that your engine is releasing and using that to heat your car. The air is filtered for, first, of course, right? But the, your engine, as it's trying to move the car forward, it's also generating a lot of heat, and that heat is used to, to heat the cabin. 
Um, some power plants do this as well. Uh, they produce electricity and a lot of the, the energy that is lost as heat they can capitalize on to heat the building or heat surrounding buildings or homes. Um, so what determines the type of energy used, whether it's coal or wood or gas or whatever, um, how, do you, how do you figure out which type of energy that you're going to use? Well, it's going to depend on accessibility. We talked about how wood is easy to access, right? So if you're in dire straits, uh, you're more likely to use something like wood because it's easy to get to, it's easy to process, it's easy to use. Whereas something like oil from a tar sands is going to require a whole lot of infrastructure to use. Um, are there government regulations around the fuel source? Is it subsidized? For example, the fossil fuel industry is subsidized in many countries, partic uh, particularly the U.S. Um, and uh, in 2015, there were over $450 billion in government subsidies for fossil fuels, which basically helps reduce the cost of production for these fossil fuel companies, making things like gas, coal, and, and uh, oil much cheaper for the consumer to buy. Uh, that can come through the form of tax breaks, low-cost loans, or government investments into um, these products. So something that is subsidized is um, the price is artificially lowered. But also, is it restricted? Is it taxed? Um, and uh, that goes hand in hand with the price. Is it cheap? Is it or is it expensive? Is it is there a tax on it? Are you more less likely to buy it that way? Um, and if we look at energy accessibility, right there. Yeah, like there are limits, of course, but there's also um, the ingenuity and creativity of the human race cannot be overlooked. This is uh, William Kakwamba at, at age 14. Uh, well, he's not 14 anymore, but um, he's, he's from Malawi, which is a country in southeast Africa. And at age 14, he built wood turbines using scrap metal and garbage he found laying around um, to generate electricity for his village. And he's since then built two more wind turbines. You can see it here. And he also built a solar-powered water pump, which supplied them, his village with the first uh, uh, pumped drinking water ever. Uh, so he's uh, really, it's a really amazing story. He has a children's book written about him. He has a Netflix movie made about him. Uh, it's really fantastic and an example of like, although there are limits to the energy we can uh, access, um, it, it's maybe not as, it's only as limited as your imagination. Uh, okay, and the last thing I want to talk about are trends in energy use around the world, right? I mentioned that most of the world relies on fossil fuels, right? You can see that a huge uh, amount, 41% is petroleum or oil. That's a lot of that is transportation, like cars and planes. Uh, coal is another 25%, mostly used for electricity generation, and natural gas is another 20%, right? So that's, what, close to 86% of the energy usage is fossil fuels, uh, that's a problem because not only do they produce CO2, but they also pollute the air with other particles that are bad for you to breathe. We'll talk about that later on. Um, if we look at uh, the patterns between renewable energy, though, which are things unlike fossil fuels like wind and solar and uh, hydroelectric, we see that developing countries are actually investing in um, renewable energy at a much slower rate than developed countries. So developed countries are in blue. You can see they've, uh, you know, they've definitely invested in renewable energy, whereas uh, developing countries are investing it uh, faster. Uh, and that allows some of these developing countries to sort of skip uh, the fossil fuel usage in terms of their demographic transition. Because as a country goes through the demographic transition, their reliance on fossil fuel increases. As they have more people, they need cheaper energy that is easier to access. Plus, we already have all the infrastructure to access and um, process things like coal and oil. We already have the plants and the pipelines built. Um, but some of these countries are skipping fossil fuel usage or they're dramatically shortening the range in which they re re need to rely on it um, because they are in integrating renewable energy into their industrializa industrialization process. And that includes companies like China, uh, companies, countries like China, Brazil, India, Kenya, uh, even, uh, well, maybe not Japan, but because um, they've kind of um, post-industrial now. Um, so if we can... Um, as a developed country, if we can lend our support in more ways than one to these countries, we can help reduce the world's dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, in the United States, more specifically, uh, we see a similar pattern with, a, you know, 69% uh, of our energy consumption is uh, petroleum and natural gas, another 11% on coal, 8% uh, on nuclear power, and renewable energy is 11% of our energy usage in 2019, a big a uh, chunk of that is biomass, burning stuff, um, and uh, another chunk of that is uh, wind and hydroelectric. Solar is growing, which is good. Um, if we look at the change in these 
usages over time, right? We can see that coal has um, been pretty steady. It started to rise in the 80s and 90s, and then we got to 2010 and it started to dip off. That's good. Natural gas, which burns cleaner than coal and oil, is um, grown in more recent years and is still expanding. Oil has grown and continues to grow as our reliance on cars continues. Nuclear has expanded significantly and renewables have expanded, um, but not as significant as we need them to. You can see they only make up a small chunk of our total energy usage in 2019. Um, a lot of this, uh, this is the same sort of graph that we're looking at here, except now we're looking at future predictions. This is the current day here, 2021, and um, we're looking ahead. We need to continue to drop our coal, uh, and uh, natural gas is probably going to expand. Hopefully renewables will expand significantly, um, and nuclear, well, you know, there's still a lot of controversy about whether the nuclear is uh, the best option for us or not. Um, meanwhile, renewables need to be expanded substantially, both in terms of uh, solar, which it needs to grow to almost like 50% of our renewable energy and wind are going to be the biggest two areas of growth for renewable energy, solar and wind. Uh, what is that energy used for in the United States, right? This is a flow chart, might look a little overwhelming, but um, if we look at petroleum, oil, most of that, over 70% of that is used for transportation. Uh, natural gas is split between the transportation sector, industrial sector, residential heating, commercial heating, or electricity generation. Renewable energy is also split pretty evenly. Coal is used almost exclusively for electricity generation. Nuclear energy is used exclusively for electricity generation. Um, so we use these different fuel sources for different things. Um, renewable energy and natural gas are probably the most versatile. But petroleum is not is really only used for um, transportation. Some people have oil boilers in the basement to heat their homes, but not, not so much anymore. Um, this is a similar flow chart for the United States in 2019, looking at total energy usage and what we used it for. It's pretty overwhelming, but it's also pretty cool. Um, and if we take a look, right, a huge chunk of natural gas is being used for electricity generation. A huge chunk is used for residential and commercial heating, but also industrial heating, right? Uh, the, green bar here is petroleum. You can see almost all of it is being used for transportation. A small chunk of it is being used in industrial uses um, to provide energy sources. You know, hydroelectric is to generate electricity, winds to generate electricity. What I want you to pay attention now are these light gray bars here, rejected energy. And that goes back to the second law of thermodynamics. No energy transfer is complete. So a huge chunk, look at all of this energy here that we see, is just being lost to the universe as heat. Right? So if we can find ways to lower this number and decrease our dependence on things like petroleum, coal, and gas and move towards these top ones, uh, we can start to shift the energy paradigm in the United States. Uh, I'm going to flip now to this same chart except for Connecticut in 2018, I think. Um, so we can see significant differences. Obviously, the numbers are lower um, because Connecticut is just a state. But if you look, nuclear pays, plays a much bigger role in Connecticut. Uh, wind plays a much smaller role. Uh, hydroelectric plays a much smaller role. This is Connecticut here. Natural gas plays a smaller role. Coal plays a way smaller role. Right? Look at the line for coal in Connecticut versus the United States. Um, everything plays a smaller role except uh, nuclear. Um, and uh, solar is about the same. So uh, there are different patterns in different states. We'll be investigating Connecticut's patterns uh, in depth. Um, and uh, lastly, this is how we use energy in our homes. Uh, a lot of it is used on heating, uh, a significant amount of it. Generating heat requires a lot of energy, uh, but also cooling and the heating of water, things like lighting, electronics, and are, take up a lot. For refrigerating things takes up a huge chunk just on its own. Your fridge uses almost 10% of the electricity in your house. All right, so that's all I got for you today. Uh, we will start diving into different types of energy more specifically as the unit pro progresses. Uh, but until then, save your questions for class, and I will see you then.